Welcome back to The Emily Show. In a wild new lawsuit filed by Rust Set Armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, there is a lot of new information, a lot of allegations, a whole bunch of hearsay, not a ton of dates, and some very interesting screenshots of text messages. This lawsuit is against Seth Kinney and his business, PDQ Prop. So she is suing the Prop Master house that provided the ammo to the set of rust and has quite a detailed backstory about a brand new and suspicious box of ammo that showed up the morning that Helena Hutchins was fatally shot. That alone is wild new information that out of the blue and without her knowledge, there was a new full set of ammo and then provides a backstory from, again, her allegations in her lawsuit and her perspective, but provides a backstory about discord between her boss, Sarah, her uh, and Seth Kinney, text messages that had gone back and forth, and the fact that there was already discord between the individuals. And Seth had told a third party that he never wanted to work with Hannah again after it seems she raised the issue of a misfire on set by another prop handler and a misfire by Baldwin's stunt double. It's very interesting to see that there was already hostility on set. And then a mysterious box of ammo arrives the morning of the fatal shooting. The, what I know from going through this lawsuit for a fact is that if all this information, and I can only assume that it is, if all this information has been provided to law enforcement, again, can only assume that it has been, there's a lot for them to dig through to figure out whether this was actually sabotage on set, which has been alluded to in numerous ways. And I'd said before, I'm not seeing it. This lawsuit lays out um, their theory of how that happened and why. And if that's what law enforcement is parsing through, there is a lot to uncover. And the mystery of what happened on the Rust set is just unraveling more. Today's episode comes from a fairly long live stream that I did. I have condensed the parts just about this lawsuit, and it is my first reaction to reading this lawsuit. There will be, I'm sure, more thought and a the more things that I pull out of this lawsuit as time goes on, but this is my initial first reaction, the questions that I have. And again, this is a condensed version of a live stream from my YouTube channel. So sit back, listen up, and let me know what you think of the allegations made here, because man, oh man, I can't wait to hear what your thoughts. And this you're in for a wild one with this lawsuit. There's a lot of allegations and shade going on here, and I can't wait to hear what you think about it. Hey there. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Adam and Eve. Sponsorships on this channel allow me to continue to create the content that I want to bring you and talk about the stories that need to be told, no matter how silly or how serious. And something that is very serious is that Valentine's Day is right around the corner. And Adam and Eve has a tremendous selection for you, for your partner, for that one friend that maybe needs a little something extra in their life. They have 24-hour customer service, 90-day no-hassle returns, and 20% of their profit goes to fighting the spread of HIV around the world, which is just an incredible thing. They also come in discreet packaging, so no matter what you pick, it's nobody else's business, and they don't need to know. If you use our code CASE, that's right, CASE, you get 50% off one item plus free shipping in the U.S. and Canada. And of course, some exclusions apply. So go on over to adamandeve.com code CASE for 50% off one item plus free shipping. Thank you so much, Adam and Eve, for sponsoring today's video. We should get back to the case at hand. 
Let's talk about this new Rust lawsuit. It's coming from the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who was in charge of the weapons against Seth Kinney and PDQ Arm and Prop, the Prop House. So this is the armorer civilly suing the Prop House. Oh, what I should say and didn't say in the last bit too, as just a reminder, especially for all of our, our international crew, with civil lawsuits, the remedy is generally money or injunctions. Injunctions meaning do this or don't do this. Money meaning pay. Jail is not on the table there. Civil remedies are on the table. So civil remedies could be, you know, money, an injunction from talking about somebody, turning an Instagram account over to a company like in the Haley Page suit. There are there are different types of civil relief, but they are not prison related. Those are only criminal cases. So with this, this is a civil lawsuit, which is going to be over money damages and possibly other things. This is a first look for me. So we will see. Complaint for violations of New Mexico's Unfair Trade Practices Act, introducing dangerous products onto movie sets, strict product liability, and false label representations. This case arises out of a shooting that occurred on the Rust production set that occurred on October 21st, 2021, that killed Helena Hutchins and wounded Joel Souza. The parties, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is a resident of Arizona. Seth Keeney is a resident of New Mexico, they believe, uh, and the founder and managing member of PDQ Arm and Prop. Defendant PDQ Arm and Prop is a domestic limited liability company with a registered agent. So this is filed in the second judicial district, County of Bernalillo, state of New Mexico. So state court in New Mexico, not federal court. Background, in or about August and September 2021, on a different movie set in Texas, defendant Seth Keeney enlisted Theo Reed to help train actors at a shooting range in, and I'm assuming, hopefully they will disclose who Theo Reed is. I am guessing Theo Reed is the father of Hannah Gutierrez Reed. To help train actors at a shooting range in the use of live fired rounds at a license range off the movie set. This is a different movie set. This training was to help the actors understand the way a firearm would recoil after live fire. By the way, a tangent in my brain. I don't think I brought this up when I talked about the Alec Baldwin rust set interview because it occurred to me later, but Alec Baldwin said it took him 45 minutes to perceive that a live round could have been in the gun, but Live rounds have a lot of kick. Non-live rounds, to my understanding, don't kick, which is he described in that interview. I should maybe talk about this again. But he described in that interview that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed would instruct him on how to act the kick, how to make the kick of the gun happen when shooting non-live rounds so that it looked real and that he would have to understand the way it kicked and understand how to use his body, body, body to make that happen. So how did it take him 45 minutes to conceive of a live round when the gun would have had to have had kickback because it fired a live round? We know a live round fired. The gun would have kicked. It would have recoiled. So how... How do you not know? Because a dummy round would have had no recoil. You have to act the recoil. And he was taught to act the recoil. He talked about her telling her how to act the recoil. But then he fired a live round and there would have been recoil. So how does it take you 45 minutes? I have questions. Anyway, this training was to help the actors understand the way a firearm would recoil after live fire so that they could simulate the recoil during filming. There were never live rounds on the Texas set, but instead this instruction occurred off-site at a licensed shooting range, which seems appropriate. Following the training, Seth took the ammo can and its contents with him in his van. Thiel estimated the, estimated the ammo can contained 200 to 300 live uh, 45 Colt rounds, which included Starline brass reloaded live rounds. I have no idea what any of that means, but okay. Oh, they're going to tell us. Great. Starline Brass is a company that produces ammo brass casings that can be made into dummy blank or live ammo by anyone with the knowledge and equipment to do so. The company does not itself make live rounds. So the company makes brass casings. Anyone with access to the dummy rounds could convert them into live rounds with the proper reloading equipment. Well, where is this going? 
On October 4th, 2021, Rust Production hired Hannah Gutierrez-Reed as an independent contractor for the positions of armorer and key props assistants on Rust. Oh, there we go. Hannah is the daughter of Theo Reed, longtime Hollywood armorer, who trained Hannah. As Rust armorer, Hannah was responsible for maintaining and managing operation of firearm-related movie props. As key props assistant, she was responsible for assisting with a multitude of prop duties as requested by Miss Zachary and production. The Rust script was very gun-heavy. Well, if it was gun-heavy, why did you have her doing two things? I have questions. It seems ill-advised. Um, was a very gun-heavy Western script with guns needed in 10 of the 12 filming days leading up to the October 21st, leading up to October 21st, and gunfire on at least half of the shooting days, according to the call sheets. The gun-heavy script required Hannah to perform a significant amount of work each day as both armor and key props assistant. Hannah was to be paid approximately a total of $7,500 for both jobs combined. Is that scale? Why does that seem so low? That seems low. Production hired Sarah Zachary as props manager, and she was responsible for obtaining and maintaining all movie props on uh, for Rust. Production also hired Sarah's future sister-in-law, Nicole Bontoya, as props assistant. Both Hannah and Sarah were 24 years old when they were hired. Uh, Nicole was 19. I'm curious as to why they're pointing that out here. Just I'm wondering how that will turn in. Are they trying to say that they weren't qualified for these tasks? That seems like an odd argument to make in a lawsuit. Defendant Seth Keeney was instrumental in recommending both Hannah and Sarah for hire on the Rust set. Rust production was a, quote, low-budget film. It had a rushed and chaotic atmosphere, culminating on the day of the tragedy with the abrupt and unexpected resignations of members of the camera crew on October 20th. All the while, the props and armor departments were expected to teach each other and do more with less. The introduction of live rounds on set, which no one anticipated, combined with the rushed and chaotic atmosphere, created a perfect storm for the safety incident. Rust was a Western movie whose props included pistols, rifles, dummy ammo, and blank ammo. Here in blanks and dummies. A dummy round or drill round is a round that is completely inert, contains no primer, propellant, or explosive charge. A blank round is a cartridge containing powder only without a bullet. At no time was live ammunition to be used. So a dummy would be in a rifle so it looked like there were bullets in it because you would need the back of the brass to show the gun to make it look like it had bullets. And the blank round gives a little bit of a of a projection or an off put when you fire it is my understanding. Live ammo means, you know, a bullet. The source of the ammo and firearms. On October 4th, Sarah and Hannah met with Seth Keeney at PDQ Arm and Props in Albuquerque to collect the necessary dummy and blank ammunition and firearms for rust. Defendant uh, Keeney and his company were the primary distributor of ammunition and firearms to rust. Over the course of the rust production, Sarah would from time to time bring other boxes labeled dummy ammo onto set. Well, where did Sarah get them from? Defendant Keeney and his company distributed dummies in boxes with labels affixed that read dummy rounds 45 or 45 LC. Within each box was a plastic tray of 50 cartridges packaged in 10 columns of five individual rounds. Defendants also supplied 44 slash 40 caliber dummy rounds. When not in use, all firearms were maintained in a locked safe in a prop truck. Dummy and blank ammo were not routinely locked in the safe, and there was no protocol calling for the ammunition to be locked up because nobody would have ever expected that this could happen. Hannah purchased this safe for the productions using production credit card and has a copy of the receipt. So they're saying we bought a gun safe and locked it up or we bought a safe with a code. Only Hannah, Sarah, and the props assistant knew the code to the safe. Hannah believed. The cause of the fallout between Seth and Hannah. Oh. Oh. There's fallout. Um. Um. On October 16th, five days prior to the tragic shooting on the rust set, Sarah had an accidental slash negligent discharge of a weapon on set firing a blank round at her foot. Within 15 to 20 minutes of that accidental discharge, Baldwin's stunt double accidentally slash negligently discharged a round from his weapon inside a cabin on set nearby, as confirmed and reported by the LA Times on November 20th. Hannah confronted Sarah on the accidental slash negligent discharge Well, this is the first time we're hearing any of this. This is all new info on 
the rust stuff. Hannah confronted Sarah on her accidental negligent discharge, wanted to know what had happened, and indicated that they would need to tell production about it um, and that it could impact Sarah's ability to handle weapons on set. Seems appropriate. This led to a heated text exchange between Seth Kinney and Hannah over Sarah's accidental negligent discharge and the reporting of it. Oh, no. Seth took Sarah's side and essentially told Hannah to back off that mistakes happen and that Hannah needed to remember that Sarah was her boss and not to push it. This is a good time to rem remember that lawsuits are allegations and shade, and this is only one side of the story. I know I say that all the time, and I also see text messages uh, photographed below, so we're going to get to that in just a second. Hannah interpreted this as... This is an awkward sentence. Hannah interpreted this as that Seth, who was called the armorer mentor in call sheets, wanted to sweep this security incident under the rug. The term armorer mentor does not seem to be a position that is used or understood on film sets generally. This is titled text between Hannah. And the thing is the screenshot is of a text and it says text between Hannah dot, 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 I wonder if they labeled the photos that because anyway, it's showing a screenshot of what purports to be Seth talking to Hannah and the text in the, you know, the text in the other party's side says accidental discharges are accidents. A mistake is where the armorer provides a gun and fully load ammo to be fired with a horse in the vicinity. Will you tell production about that? We learn and move on and don't forget she's your boss. Don't push it. The blue bubble text then says, excuse you, question mark. What mistakes do you think I'm making, question mark? Will I tell production about what, question mark? You think I'm some fucking rat or something? You think I'm running to production to tattle? You have me fucked up, Seth. If she doesn't like me when I barely said anything about it, you can come back and finish the show. I'm not going to stay where I'm a fucking problem. Oh, boy. Well, we also know that law enforcement has Hannah Gutierrez's phone. So law enforcement would have all of this already. And this seems to be before the camera crew walked off the set. Yikes. But I'm interested to see next what... Hannah Gutierrez Reed told production because this seems to be that she was told not to tell production. And if she was told not to tell production, that also leans in backing up that Alec Baldwin say he was not aware at the time that there were safety incidents, which is interesting because he did say that in the ABC interview. On or around October 17th or 18th, Seth called a friend of his who he had met through Theo Reed, Hannah's father, Officer Troy Task of Bullhead City, Arizona. What? Seth stated to Troy, how do we know this? Okay, hopefully they'll explain how we know. Seth stated to Troy that he never wanted to work with Hannah again. Seth also falsely accused Hannah of using derogatory language about Sarah three times on set. But who told who? Did Troy then tell Thiel? who then told Hannah, how many levels of hearsay is this? Because how do we know that Seth had this conversation? They're suing Keeney, Seth. So how do they know what he said in that conversation? I, I don't know. I don't know how they know. It's a lot of layers of hearsay. So things are not going well between Seth and Hannah. The morning of the tragedy and the unexplained arrival of a newly full ammo box. Oh, sh oh shit. So, okay. I This is a first look. Here's where I think this is going. Are they going to allude, and I'm stopping reading so I can tell you what I think. Are they going to allude that they were setting up Hannah to never work again as an armorer? Is that where this is going? Is that what they're going to allege? Um, that this was done maliciously 
to ruin Hannah's career because of this discord earlier on set. I really, really, really hope that this is not, that this is not the direction this is going in. Let's see if it is. This is why we do first looks together because I'm reading this and you're getting my first reactions. The morning of this tragedy on October 21st, fellow Rust set employees Sarah Zachary and Nicole Montoya were the first people in the prop trailer. Sarah was already in the prop safe retrieving the firearms when Hannah arrived. Why? She's not the armorer. This was unusual. Oh, good. I'm not the only one thinking it. This was unusual as Hannah was the person who typically retrieved the firearms from the safe by herself because it seems like that's her job to do that. Oh, Lord. When Hannah arrived at the prop truck that same morning, she saw a box labeled Dummy Rounds 45 LC, completely full, which someone had placed on top of Hannah's equipment bag. Hannah had not seen a full box of Dummy Rounds in weeks, nor was this full box on the equipment bag when Hannah had last been in the prop trailer. Upon information and belief, the Dummy Rounds and Live Rounds came from defendants. Sarah has since acknowledged in a report by the LA Times on November 20th, then a new box of presumed 45 caliber long Colt dummy rounds appeared on set that day. From where and why? How, how did the ammo get on set? And who put it into the prop trailer? Someone put the box in the prop trailer. Oh my God, this is, this is going to be bad. This is why there's an ongoing investigation still. Because there's drama behind the scenes here that might provide motive is what I'm seeing. Wow. The next paragraph said, Hannah exclaimed words to the effect of what is this? The reason they say words to the effect of, and this is me speculating is because what I'm sure Hannah said was something along the lines of what the fuck is this? And where the fuck did it come from? And why the fuck are you touching the guns? That's not your job. Get the fuck away from my department. I'm sure that it was more colorful because she's already mad and one can't fault her for this. Hannah exclaimed words to the effect of what is this? We have been looking for a full box of dummy rounds for weeks. Where did this come from? I'm sure they're downplaying the amount of fucks that were said in there. But I also understand that this is a lawsuit and that's fine. She said, what the fuck is this? We've been looking for a box of dummy rounds for weeks. How did this just show up now? Where the fuck did this come from and who put it here? Which is, you know, I hear it. Sarah was the same person who had been bringing all the dummy ammo boxes onto set from defendants, but she did not respond as to where this full box came from after Hannah made her comments. Prop assistant Nicole simply giggled in response to Hannah's questions. Dude. Who set up the armorer is my question. And again, lawsuits are allegations and shade, but also what they are alluding to in this lawsuit is not good at all. Wow. Props assistant Nicole simply giggled in response to Hannah's questions. No one in the prop truck acknowledged or claimed to be the source of the full box of 45 caliber long Colt dummy ammunition that morning. Hannah shook the box and heard a jingling sound, which is what a dummy round box should sound like. It was a busy morning and Hannah was happy that they had a full box of dummy rounds to work with because Sarah as prop manager had brought dummy rounds to the set in the past as part of her duties. Hannah didn't think any more of it at the time. Around 7.30 a.m., Hannah noted that the video camera system and app that allowed the crew to watch scenes going on in real time and store content to the cloud, quote, Video Village, was down. As a result, Hannah was unable to view the various camera scenes and what they were filming. Video v Village was always supposed to be up so that Hannah, Makeup, and others on set could see what they uh, when they were needed and follow what was going on with the film scenes as they were happening, for example, inside buildings. And we've heard that the buildings on set were close quarters, and we've heard that due to vid-19 precautions, they were trying to very much limit the amount of people inside those buildings while they were shooting. So I imagine that Video Village was essential. 
At approximately 10 a.m., Hannah, Sarah, and Nicole loaded Alec Baldwin's gun and two other guns for use in scenes that day with dummy rounds from the full dummy round box found that morning in the prop truck. For Alec Baldwin's gun, Hannah loaded four dummy rounds with holes in them from her pants pocket, a fifth dummy round from the box with a hole in it, and an attempt to load a sixth dummy round with a hole in it from the box, but it would not go into the chamber, and she thought that the chamber might need to be cleaned. We heard this in the search warrant for Alec Baldwin's phone. In the search warrant, it talked about the interview with Hannah Gutierrez-Reed and says essentially the same thing that... She tried to load a sixth and it was wonky and that tried to clean it. Let's see if wonky pops up in here too, because it popped up in that search warrant. Hannah remembers shaking the sixth round to ensure herself that it was a dummy round. Sarah and Nicole helped load the other weapons and the bandoliers. They were all placed on the prop cart. No, no mention of wonky round. Hannah handed the gun to Alec Baldwin just after 10 a.m., and he had continuous possession of the gun with the five dummy rounds loaded into it until the set broke for lunch around 1230. During this time, Baldwin was involved in various scenes. Hannah asked Baldwin approximately every 30 minutes if the scene cut, if Baldwin wanted to give her the gun back, and he said no. Hannah also sent Nicole over to ask Baldwin if he wanted to hand the gun back to her for holding, but Baldwin said no and that he was okay to continue holding it. When the set broke for lunch at 1230, Baldwin gave his gun back to Hannah. Hannah, Sarah, and Nicole locked the guns back up in this prop truck uh, inside gun socks. Gun socks provide an extra layer of protection for rifles and guns when traveling or in storage. The afternoon of the tragic shooting. When the three returned from lunch a little before 1.30, Sarah and Nicole pulled the guns out of the safe, and they and Hannah carried the guns and placed them back on the cart. Hannah had to step away for a brief period and asked Sarah and Nicole to watch the guns. When she came back, she noticed that the two had wandered some feet away and that the guns were unattended for perhaps five minutes. How do they assume it was five minutes? She doesn't know how long they wandered away. No one knows. She doesn't know. How would she have known if she came back and they had been gone? How do you know how long they've been gone for? The questions I ask, because that's a conclusory statement. No one knows. Hannah remembered the chamber that she believed needed to be clean in Baldwin's gun, and she cleaned it, and then Hannah pulled another round from the dummy box, shook it, and placed it in the chamber. To the best of Hannah's knowledge, the gun was now loaded with six dummy rounds. Indeed, defendants as suppliers of prop and ammo to the set, to the rust set, sold, distributed, and advertised its props as dummy ammunition and not live rounds. Hannah relied upon and trusted that defendants would only supply prop ammunition or blanks, and no live rounds were ever to be on set. Assistant Director Halls told Hannah in her earpiece in a rushed fashion that Baldwin's gun was needed inside the church. Production was behind several hours because the camera crew had quit the night before. Apparently, this is also the cause of Video Village being down on October 21st. The camera crew quit the night before but left their equipment behind. It's an awkward sentence. Instead, they opted to drive the long distance again in the morning to set apparently to get their equipment Curiously, the long distance drive was the main reason for them quitting in the first place. I don't know why any of that's relevant to this lawsuit, but okay. Hannah brought the gun to AD Halls inside the church. Hannah spun the cylinder for Halls and showed him the six loaded dummy rounds. Baldwin was not inside the church. Halls took custody of the weapon and was inside the church sitting in a pew. There were multiple people inside the church. Production had emphasized to everyone on set that they would be adhering to the strictest of uh, vid 19 protocols and Hannah was cognizant that the inside of the church was not a large space for a number of people inside hall said to Hannah that he would just be sitting in with the gun, meaning the gun wasn't going to be used at all since this wasn't a scene or rehearsal. Interesting. Hannah told halls to let her know if Baldwin came back so that she could come back inside of the church and reinspect the weapon and provide it to Baldwin herself as she had done every time before on set. Her point was that if plans were going to change for use of the gun to be more than just sitting in status, Hannah needed to be called back into the church on this set. Hannah had a split role as both armor and assistant uh, key assistant props. She had to fulfill both roles frequently f- flitting. Is that the word we want to use in this lawsuit to describe a 24-year-old doing a professional job? Is flitting the word we use? 
frequently flitting back and forth between the two sets of responsibilities. I'm just saying the use of flitting instead of rushing or being pulled gives the indication of someone who is light in care of their duties. Just like, oh, we're just flittering back and forth. It, it, it's a strange choice. Maybe that's just me being picky. Let me know if you think that's me being picky. It's a strange choice. Knowing that no gun scene was going on at the time, according to Halls, and with the awareness of the vid-19 protocols and social distancing, Hannah then walked outside the church to prepare her fanny pack for scenes that afternoon and do some of her prop duties. Again, production was behind that day, and Hannah was acutely aware of the need to attend to her prop duties as well for scenes that afternoon. Therefore, Hannah did not see the weapon, nor did she have custody of it for approximately 15 minutes. Sometime in that approximately 15-minute period, A.D. Halls gave the firearm to Alec Baldwin, calling out cold gun, which signified that the firearm was empty or contained only inert dummy ammunition. Hannah was not inside the church and out of earshot at, and did not hear this called out by Halls. So how is this in your lawsuit? How do you know that that happened? There's reports that that happened, but this, you don't know that for sure. How do you know? How do you know that that is a fact? I am curious. After receipt of the firearm from Halls, Baldwin has stated that he begun practicing the cross draw from his shoulder holster and camera angles with Helena Hutchins for an upcoming scene. Yeah, he did say that in an ABC interview. No one from production, including Halls, told Hannah that Baldwin was back and that he was going to rehearse a gun scene inside the church. It was protocol for Halls to tell Hannah when first team, including Baldwin, was back on scene to film. This was not a scheduled rehearsal and neither Halls nor anyone else called out a rehearsal. So what happened? Inside the church, as Alec Baldwin crossed through the firearm, he stated that Helena directed him to point the firearm at an angle that was pointed towards Helena, which he did. Are they pulling this from the ABC interview? Because they don't say where he said this. So are they now using Alec Baldwin's ABC interview as a part of his as a part of their lawsuit. I'm so curious, where did he say it? Where are we pulling the information from? Is it from that interview? I'm dying to know. This is why you don't give interviews. <sighs> he said that Helena directed him to point the firearm at an angle that was pointed towards Helena, which he did. As Baldwin further described, he pulled the hammer back and let it go. And according to him, the gun just went off, firing what he later learned was a live round directly at Helena, fatally striking her. That is from the ABC interview. I've watched it enough and commented on it enough that that is exactly how he described that going down in the ABC interview, different than any other public comment I've seen him make. Had Hannah been called back in, she would have reinspected the weapon and every round again and instructed Baldwin on safe gun practice with the cross draw, as was her standard practice on set and under circumstances where one, Baldwin did not respond to Helena's request, or sorry, Baldwin did not respond to Hannah's request on October 15th to schedule cross drawing training, and two, the gun had been out of her possession for 15 minutes. Hannah would never have let Baldwin point the weapon directly at Helena as part of a standard safe gun practices. Apparently, no one inside the church stopped Baldwin from doing so, including A.D. Halls. Let's hear about the aftermath of the shooting. The aftermath of the shooting, as the shot went off, Sarah, who was outside the church and near Hannah and the ammo cart, exclaimed, what was that? Hannah responded that she didn't know. Sarah then asked, was that the gun? Hannah said it couldn't be the gun, and she believed it had to be special effects because Hannah knew in her mind that the gun was loaded with dummy rounds when she handed it to Halls. Thereafter, Hannah heard shouting in her earpiece and complete commotion. Hannah went inside the church, whereupon she saw Helena and Joel Souza lying on the ground, and they were bleeding. Reports from the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office revealed that there were 14 people total in the church at the time of the shooting, including Helena and Joel. Hannah was trying to make sense of a situation while people shouted for her to leave the church. It became apparent that a tragedy had occurred and that it had involved Alec Baldwin's weapon. Hannah ran outside the church and yelled back to Halls that she needed to take custody of the weapon and inspect it. Halls brought her the weapon and Hannah inspected it, finding the spent casing. This is more information than we got in the search warrant as well. This is the first time we're really getting much from Hannah because this is the lawsuit filed from her. At that point, Hannah was trying to figure out, it's the way they're writing this in parts is interesting. The way they're writing this is interesting. 
I'm just, I'm going to leave it there. At that point, Hannah was trying to figure out if this had been a dummy round with a hot primer or possibly a live round inside the weapon. I don't know how you would know that from the casing, but there are people who are experts in this and I am not one. At around 11.49 p.m., a call was made to 911 by Mamie Mitchell, whose lawsuit we've also covered on this channel and on the podcast. Law enforcement was dispatched to the scene at 1.52 p.m. Meanwhile, Hannah told Sarah to inspect the ammo box immediately to determine if there were any live rounds in the box. How's Sarah supposed to know? Sarah's not the armorer. How's Sarah supposed to know if there are live rounds or not? I'm, I'm lacking information on Sarah's expertise to check that box for ammo. I, I want to know why Hannah didn't make that call because Hannah is the armorer. Hannah told Sarah to inspect the ammo box immediately and determine if there were any live rounds in it. Sarah returned from the prop cart within minutes and said that there were other suspected live rounds in the ammo box. Well, that's interesting. It's unclear how Sarah was able to make this determination so quickly, what her procedure was in checking the rounds, and how thoroughly she did so. Why was she asked to do it in the first place? At some point thereafter, Sarah told Hannah that she had called Seth Kinney and that he said that there were live rounds, or he said that the live rounds were not his. Where did this ammo box come from? Who brought this ammo box to set? Who loaded it? But there's a lot in here that is hearsay with no backing up. Hannah was upset and art manager Brian. Brian who? Just Brian? No last name, just Brian. What up, B? Hannah was upset, naturally. And art manager Brian led her around another building out of view of the cart to console her. When Hannah reemerged to speak to authorities who had just arrived, she saw the cart had been moved and about moved about 40 feet to the other side of the church. It is unclear who moved the cart and for what reason. Well, it's clear it didn't get locked up before law enforcement got to it, which is also an interesting note that law enforcement will have to take into consideration in this investigation. Law enforcement response. After law enforcement and medics attended to the shooting victims, Helena and Joel, inside the church, the sheriffs then secured the scene and began collecting evidence. And we saw that because we saw the crime scene tape, the photos with the crime scene tape around a, a big bit of this set. In doing so, oh, this is new information too. In doing so, they found a suspected seven live rounds distributed inside the ammo box on the ammo cart and in the bandoliers. The live rounds had Starline brass casings with nickel primers. How did the live rounds get in the ammo box? Pictures taken from the scene by authorities on October 21st show that other guns and the ammo box were missing from the cart. How do they know that? Did law enforcement give you the photos? How do you know what's in the law enforcement photos? I have questions. Hannah wasn't sure if someone had taken some of the items from the prop cart to the prop truck after the shooting. So Hannah doesn't know what happened to everything after the shooting. Law enforcement did not search the prop truck until a full six days later on October 27th. Well, why? I got questions about that too. Why not? It's interesting because shortly after this, um, Hannah Gutierrez Reed's attorneys brought up the idea of sabotage. And now seeing their lawsuit, we get an understanding of their perspective on how this went down. This leaves a lot of questions. It also leaves question as to why law enforcement didn't search the prop truck until six days later. Regarding that search of the prop, prop truck, Catherine Rowe Walters on behalf of production told the sheriffs, how do you know what this person told the sheriffs? There is so much hearsay in here. How do you know what someone told law enforcement? But okay. Apparently this person on behalf of production told sheriffs that she would unlock the padlock placed on the truck for them. However, throughout production on the rust set prior to the shooting, the prop truck was virtually always left unlocked and accessible by anyone. I don't know how that's relevant, but it should have been locked if it was pending law enforcement inspecting it. This adds a whole nother layer of questions to this entire incident. After the police had arrived on October 21st and before Helena had been pronounced deceased, Seth made a call to police to a police officer in Bullhead City, Arizona, named Officer Troy Tesk. 
Hi, Officer Troy. Good to see you in this lawsuit again. How does anyone who's writing this lawsuit know what Seth Keeney did? How do they have this information? Were they told by the officer? Were they told by Keeney? How do they know? Oh, this is how they know. Just kidding. Keep reading, Emily. Officer, officer Tusk is best friends with Theo Reed. So this is like four layers of here. Okay. This is a lot of hearsay. So the assumption here is that Theo Reed, Hannah's father, um, or Hannah told the lawyers. It's reasonable to believe the that the father might have told the lawyers this directly. But then the father's telling the lawyers what he was told by the officer and what the officer was told by Seth. So that's kind of a mess. During that call from Seth to Troy at 4.30 or 4.03 p.m. on October 21st, just hours after the shooting and before Helena had been pronounced deceased. Oh, sorry. I skipped. No, they're repeating it. Um, Seth stated words to the effect, when you have to explain, this is a lot of hearsay. Seth stated words to the effect that to Troy, that Hannah had messed up. So Hannah's dad or Hannah told the lawyers that Seth called Troy and that Troy said that Hannah messed up. Again, leading to this illusion. But when it sounds like a junior high game of telephone, that's how you know you're in the realm of a lot of hearsay. When Seth told Troy and Troy told Thiel and then Thiel told the lawyers or Thiel told Hannah and then Hannah told the lawyers, that's a lot. But it, this statement they seem to be using to support this illusion that perhaps they were trying to ruin Hannah's reputation. That is the impression that this is leaving with me. Which, again, this is being written to the light most favorable to Hannah by her lawyers, and these are allegations. How and why Seth came to this almost immediate conclusion that Hannah had, quote, messed up and offered it up unsolicited to Troy is neither understood or yet to be explained or clarified. Oh, I just speculated about it. Because um, how would he, know? but the, it's a good question. How would he know so fast what happened? How does the person who provided the ammo know so fast that there's a mess up? Troy felt the call was very unusual. How do we know how Troy felt? Troy's not a party to this lawsuit. How do we know how Troy feels? Who did Troy tell he felt this way? Theo? Okay. Troy felt the call was very unusual in that Seth had made one of his first calls to him right after the incident. Seth told Troy only through Theo. Seth knew... <sighs> Seth knew Troy only through Thiel from prior movie sets. How do we know any of that is fact? It was suspected to, it was suspect to Troy. How do we know what's suspect to Troy? Oh my God. I cannot. This is in a lawsuit. Yes, it's giving us more information, but it's also so many lay lay layers of hearsay and speculation that it's hard to, it's, it's just, it's hard. It was suspect to Troy that Seth, oh, this feels like trying to tell a story when my kid comes home from school in eighth grade and was like, okay, so at lunch, like Sarah said to Vlad that blah, 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 blah. And I'm trying to follow along, but I, there's a lot of names and I'm trying to follow the story. And I'm like, wait, who said what to who now? That's how this is feeling right now. Who said what to who? Okay. Seth knew Troy only through Thiel from prior movie sets. So they're saying, you don't even go here? Or like, you're not even friends like that. I think they're trying to set up that Seth and Troy aren't even friends like that. And they met through Thiel. So Troy and Thiel are besties and Seth is an outsider. So why is Seth calling Troy to say that Hannah messed up? It's like, why are you calling to dime out somebody else's kid? Maybe, maybe. That's where we're going. It was sus to Troy that Seth almost immediately was implicating Hannah right after the incident without any firsthand information about the incident. How do you know that? 
How do you know that Seth didn't have any firsthand information? That is an assumption. How do you know that? Also, for those of you just listening and not watching along with what's on the screen, it doesn't say sus. It says suspect. I occasionally will substitute that when I feel that the incident calls for it. And it's not that I'm not completely empathetic to the fact that Hannah Gutierrez Reed is part of this investigation and that I'm sure there's things that went on that are weighing on her heavily, but a lawsuit full of things that are speculative and can't be proven might not help. And how Troy felt about what Seth said feels like a game of telephone and who's making the assumption that Seth had no firsthand information. Who is assuming that? I mean, it might be a proper assumption, but it's an assumption. We're just we're just pointing out things as we read them. I should note that there, when there was a search warrant issued for Baldwin's phone, there were also search warrants issued with regard to the prop house. And I feel like I'm just going to need to pull that up and we're going to need to go through that too. Right? Do we? I think we do. I think we need to go through that search warrant as well. So stay tuned. Not today. Don't worry, mods. Not today. Seth repeatedly called Troy over the next two weeks. He also texted Troy. In total, there were over 20 calls and texts that Seth made to Troy. Why? What do you think an Arizona police officer is going to do for you? During one of these later calls that we have no idea how we know what was said. During one of these later calls on November 1st, Seth was with the sheriff's lead investigator he called Troy to ask if Troy could send some of Thiel's live reloaded rounds that originally came from a known reloader who specializes in reloading rounds. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? That said reloader like four times. And it's making it hard to follow. Seth the prop master or the prop house called Troy, the police officer in Arizona to ask Troy to send some of Hannah Gutierrez Reed's father's live reloaded rounds that originally came from a known reloader who specializes in reloading rounds. Seth also texted Troy to ask if he had any live reloaded rounds with nickel primers and if he could send some of those. Seth had become aware that Thiel kept reloaded rounds at Troy's house for safekeeping. How does anyone know any of that? And is this part of the search warrant? Is that why they were looking for reloaded rounds? Upon information and belief. Oh, now we get to the upon information and belief. Seth was attempting, oh, this is upon information and belief. We think this is what Seth was doing. Seth was attempting to match one of Thiel's reloaded rounds to the live rounds retrieved on the rust set. How would Seth have had access to any of the live rounds on the rust set unless it came with the investigator and the investigator saying, look, this is what I'm looking for. But how would the lawyers for Hannah Gutierrez Reed know what happened when the investigators were at Seth's business in New Mexico? How do we know any of this? They're saying that they believe Seth was attempting to match one of Hannah's father's reloaded rounds to the live rounds retrieved on the rust set. If there was a match, presumably Seth sought to shift blame to Hannah and connect her to those rounds through her father's rounds kept at Troy's house. Seth took it upon himself to essentially investigate this matter for the sheriff's office and insert himself into this matter by attempting to implicate Hannah. Troy did not send any rounds to Seth. He did text pictures of samples of four rounds from his house to Seth, one of which included the Starline Brass head stamp markings, which have the same distinct markings as the Starline Brass rounds seized from the rust set. But also, the Starline Brass were talked about in the, um, in the search warrant. In fact, the actual live round casing that was the fatal shot had a Starline brass head stamp. Seth texted back, and again, they're going to have these texts. Law enforcement will have these in their investigation. And I imagine that these attorneys have these texts because Troy is friends with Hannah's dad. I imagine that he would have provided uh, his side of these text messages to Hannah's lawyers. That's just me speculating. Seth tested back, quote, yep, it's evidence in the accidental death. So is Seth, oh man, 
They're trying to say that Seth is trying to shift blame. Like we have a whole ass game, a clue going on in this, in this um, complaint, it, or at least reading it, that's what it feels like. And I am not trying to downplay a woman was killed based on something that happened that seems like it's nothing less than negligence, but might be worse than that. And this feels like a game of he said, she said clue of, of what is going on in a lawsuit where a lot of this is about advertising. As we get to the causes of action, we're going to get to the fact that some of this isn't going to be directly relevant to those causes of action. Part of this is a PR. I think part of this is a PR strategy to get Hannah Gutierrez's read side of the story out there. And lawsuits are allegations and shade, and we know they're often used to get a story out there. Um, but when we get to the causes of action, just ask yourself, how does this match? Because now Seth is talking about the investigation for the accidental death. And this is before, is there even a date these texts were happening? I'm trying to track back and it doesn't look like there's dates for any of this, which you know how I feel about a lawsuit without dates in it. It's all trillery when you don't put dates. What date were these texts? The December, it was right around December 16th that those search warrants were issued for the prop house and for Alec Baldwin's phone. It's hard to tell when this happened because there's no dates. It said some of the later calls were on November 1st. So I am making the assumption, though it's not clear from this lawsuit, that these are in and around early November before the search warrant came down for the prop house. Okay, so after Seth texted back, yep, quote, yep, it's evidence in an accidental death, essentially linking the Starline brass marking of the live round seized by law enforcement on set to the Starline brass markings in Troy's pictures. Yet Seth possessed hundreds of Starline brass rounds from Theo Reed in the ammo can that he took from Theo on the previous movie set, all of which are now unaccounted for. Oh, there's missing rounds, they say. You say there's missing rounds. And there's another text message oh, with somebody's number on it. Hold on. Lawyers, when you're putting in photos of text messages, don't, just don't include someone's whole ass cell phone number. Just block it out. This is public record. Just, just, I don't care if you don't like the person. Don't do that. Um, I'm going to, I will black this out before I go over this again. But I am going to show the photos and then I'll scoot past this. Um, so it's got a photo of rounds that are stamped. It's kind of blurry in the lawsuit. And then it says, I checked a bunch of the rounds. These are the four different types that I could find. And then the text back saying, yep, it's evidence in the accidental death and then saying, okay. So these are texts between, um, between Troy, the officer from Arizona and Seth, the prop house. Defendants attempts to shift blame. Oh, well, okay. We, we've speculated correctly. Keep reading. Defendants attempts to shift blame and responsibility from themselves. On November 3rd, 2021, counsel for Hannah went on the Today Show and Good Morning America on behalf of Hannah, indicated that they believed the Rust set had been sabotaged and that someone introduced live rounds on set. It's like I remembered accurately. On that same day, on November 3rd, Seth texted Troy, Seth Prop House, Troy, law enforcement officer in Arizona that's friends with Hannah's dad, again blaming Hannah for the, quote, accidental shooting. Thereafter, later, on November, later in November 2021, Seth Keeney texted Hannah and attempted to have her drop her claims of sabotage and instead cooperate with the police and implicate A.D. Halls as being the person responsible for the tragedy. Wait, what? No. Do not tell me there are text messages from the person at the prop house saying, look, let's get together and blame so-and-so. Oh, my God. I see another, I see another image coming up below. Oh, we're going to read this text. Oh, my the plot thickens? 
All right. Later in November 2021, Seth texted Hannah an attempt to have her drop her claims of sabotage and to instead cooperate with police and implicate A.D. Halls as being the person responsible for the tragedy. We now know from statements from Santa Fe law enforcement that Hannah and Halls have both turned over their phones to law enforcement. So law enforcement has this information. Seth suggested that A.D. Halls had essentially bullied Hannah and not allowed her to do her job safely. Wasn't Seth the one that told her not to complain? Because we saw that screenshot earlier. Seth stated that if she would shift blame to Halls, he would, quote, have her back. Oh, fucking hell. Let's read the screenshot. And this seems to be between Seth and Hannah. The, the blue bubble... So I'm assuming that's Hannah's side of the Hannah's side of the uh, conversation said, "Come forward for what question mark? What should I be confessing to question mark?" And then it says, "Quote, this is quoting from the screenshot of the text message. Quote, go and talk to the police. Tell them everything. Answer every question down to what you had for breakfast. You're young, certainly not green or inexperienced with period weapons, but did you get rolled over by the set system and the AD with 30 plus years of experience? Question mark. I think you did. And you're too proud to say that. Had you been partnered up with a truly professional AD, none of this would have happened. That true professional would have supported your safe efforts. Instead, you got David, quote, reckless, end quote, halls. No AD is ever to touch a gun. How many times had he grabbed guns from you, question mark? If he did it once before and you didn't kick his teeth in, you got rolled. Had you ever watched your dad hand off guns to an AD? Question mark. You're tough, but there's always someone out there that's more intimidating. Who are you to question him? Question mark. Please think about this. Take some time. I am shook. Because the prior screenshot was Seth telling her to drop it when she was trying to say that Sarah had mishandled the gun. And now he's trying to turn it back around on, oh, but wasn't it the AD's fault? Oh, shit. And this would have been not that long after. Um, Let's see. This would have been not that long after she, because it was October 21st that the incident happened and she interviewed with police. So this would have been like maybe, they say later in November. So around a month later, He's saying, go back and talk to the police again. Cause we know she'd are, oh, there's more texts. Cause we know she'd already um, spoken with police at least once. Okay, there's more texts. All right, these don't have phone numbers in them. Let's pull them back up. Seth also texted Theo Reed. He texted her dad. He texted her dad. Seth also texted Theo Reed and essentially suggested that he get Hannah to drop claims of sabotage and not let Hannah drag himself or Theo into this. These are texts from Seth. There was nothing to be gained by Hannah and her attorneys dragging me into this. If anything, the DA may perceive this as an unapologetic scapegoat tactic and lower the boom even harder. Like boom goes the dynamite? Like what boom? And lower the boom even harder. You and I will be collateral damage in this tragedy and approach. It makes no sense. How do you know what the DA is thinking? Seth? Seth, these texts don't look good. Oh my, okay. They say by this point, Seth, who had no official role in an investigation, right? had made multiple attempts to direct the investigation and to cast blame on a variety of people and deflect scrutiny from himself. I wonder what the AD, what the uh, DAs are going to think about whether or not Seth was interfering with the investigation with this behavior. Because the ammo of it all aside, is Seth, is Seth messing with or tampering with an investigation by trying to apparently manipulate um what people say to police i it will be very it will be very interesting to see how this all shakes out when the investigation's completed i just wonder if they will see it that way too it just 
it's very, very sus as laid out in this with screenshots of text messages. But again, screenshots could be sus or faked. But <sighs> the investigators have the phone. So the investigators have the phones. So they will know. <sighs> so let me just restate because I tangented. At this point, Seth, who had no official role in the investigation, had made multiple attempts to direct the investigation and to cast blame on a variety of people and deflect scrutiny from himself. The day after the shooting, Theo Reed was set to fly out from Las Vegas, Nevada, to get his daughter Hannah in Albuquerque. While in Albuquerque, Theo also wanted to revi uh, retrieve the ammo can and live rounds that Seth had taken from him on the prior movie set in August or September 2021. Okay. Theo had only told Seth, Hannah, and Troy about his flight. Strangely, when he got to the airport, American Airlines told Theo that Theo Reed had called to cancel his flight. Theo said, that's impossible. I'm Theo Reed. I never called. Wow. So Theo said he only told his daughter, Troy, the police officer, and Seth about his flight. And more mysteriously, his flight got canceled. The airline was able to rebook him on a later flight, but it pushed him back a day. It was apparent to Theo, okay, again, with, okay. It was apparent to Theo that defendant, Seth Kinney had been the one who called to cancel his flight in an apparent attempt to thwart his plans to come to Albuquerque or at least delay them. Neither Troy nor Hannah made the call canceling the flight, nor did Thiel himself. Again, this is a lot of speculation, but it's a civil lawsuit and they are telling their side of the story. I feel like I need to constantly say lawsuits are allegations in shade, but oh my. When Thiel got to Albuquerque, he proceeded to Seth's, Seth's house, PDQ arm and prop location. Is it the same? as he running the business out of his home? Because it says Seth's house slash PDQ arm and prop. Unlike every other time Thiel had come, Seth did not invite him into his house. When Thiel asked for his ammo cam back, Seth said for him to just, quote, write it off. And that he would use the rounds on other sets. Thiel agreed, and Seth maintained possession of the ammo can in rounds. Interesting. Upon execution of a search warrant on PDQ Arm and Prop about four weeks later, authorities found, how do you know what they found? And how can you attest to that in a lawsuit? Authorities found the ammo can belonging to Thiel, but it was empty of live rounds. There is no explanation as to where the remainder of the remainder of the live rounds went or what Seth did with them. How do they know? Thiel has identified this ammo can as being his. Well, I imagine law enforcement reached out to him and asked. Thiel would testify that Hannah never had a, there's no, is there a declaration attached? Because you can't just say that. Is there a declaration from Thiel attached? Because what there aren't is any sites to a declaration that say that is Hold on. What page are we on? We're on page 19. Is there a declaration? I don't see one. You can't just say that. Have, have a declaration from these people that you're basing this lawsuit off of. I'm done ranting. Okay. Theo would testify that Hannah never had access nor possession of the live reloaded Starline brass rounds that were found on the Rust set, but that Seth took hundreds of the live Starline brass rounds with him in the ammo can from a prior set. Troy would testify, maybe include declarations. Troy would testify that Hannah never had access to the reloaded live rounds kept at his house for Theo Reed. Troy can verify that he gave the ammo can containing live rounds to Theo in August to go to his movie shoot. All of this should be told to law enforcement. Troy also would relate that Hannah learned of Seth's false accusations regarding her insulting Sarah with a derogatory name. How does that matter for any of this? Hannah was baffled as to why Seth would make this allegation up, and Hannah denied ever doing so. Okay. Defendant Seth Kinney has denied ever being on 
the set of rust, but somehow had the code to the prop truck safe that Hannah had purchased for production. How do we know that? How do we know that? How do we know that? How do we know that he had the code to the prop truck safe? How do we know? Hannah never gave him the code, but it sounds like Sarah and the other chick who giggled had the code. Seth was on set supposedly for the first time ever when the warrant was served on the prop truck six days after the shooting on October 27th to help the sheriffs get into the safe. Oh, isn't that interesting? But how do you know that? It is unknown who gave him the code to the production safe. Well, it's probably Sarah. We can, we can assume that. Contrary to the truth, they say, upon information and belief, okay, Seth told law enforcement that it was his prop safe. It was the production's safe, and Hannah purchased it and has a copy of the receipts to prove this. This should all be going through the investigation. This he said, she said of it all is all part of the investigation. Tell this all to law enforcement. Why is this all in this civil suit right now? Defendant Keeney had access to the rust set, knowledge of the code of the prop safe, and with his company, PDQ Arm and Prop, and his company, PDQ Arm and Prop, was the primary supplier of guns and ammo on the rust set. Upon information and belief, after the October 16th accidental discharge by Sarah Zachary, defendant Seth Kinney said he never wanted to work with Hannah again. The live reloaded star brass rounds upon information and belief originated from a known reloader and then went to Theo Reed and into the Theo Reed ammo can to defendant Seth Kinney. Seth Kinney had a longstanding relationship with the reloader. Seth Kinney apparently believed that the rounds found on set connected back to the rounds from the reloader, which is why he made the calls to Troy right after the shooting incident, requesting Troy send him live round samples. Count one, violation of New Mexico's Unfair Trade Practices Act. None of, ha like, what did we just read that has anything to do with unfair trade practices? Um, the unfair methods of competition and unfair and deceptive acts or practices. How is anything we read an unfair business practice? Is anything in those facts related to an unfair business practice? Help me. I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing the unfair business practice. Let's see what they said. These acts are include representation of a particular standard that props were dummy rounds and safe and effective products for use on a movie set when in fact they were unsafe live rounds and never should have been on a movie set. Such representations were untrue and false and misleading. But how, okay. Defendants provided ammo boxes with 45 Colt dummy labels. The ammunition box failed to state a material fact that contents contained both dummy and live ammo. Such was a deceptive practice. Okay. Creation of a dangerous condition, strict product liability. Okay, maybe on this one. Defendants are in the business of putting prop dummy ammunition into the market. The ammunition was misrepresented as only dummy ammo when it contained both dummy and live ammo. Okay, so there's your strict products liability. I didn't think we'd get to products liability on this channel like ever, but here we are with products liability. Defendants in turn failed to provide any warnings as to this potentially dangerous condition that they created. So they're... Their causes of action are saying that Seth Kinney, the prop house, intentionally put live rounds into these boxes labeled as dummy rounds. That is what they're alleging. So they're using those facts to support their, their allegations that he put live rounds into these boxes. Strict product liability, false and deceptive product labels, and false material representations. This is going along the same allegations. Breach of contract. How is a breach of contract with her, though? How did you, how did the prop house breach a contract with Hannah Gutierrez Reed? Wouldn't the contract have been with production? I'm just saying. Plaintiff and defendants had an oral contract to share proceeds for prop and armor work on the Old Way movie set filmed in Montana, also in 2021 before Rust. What? You're suing breach of contract on an oral contract from another movie set that has nothing to do with Rust? Are you kidding me? Why? Why? And what in the world, in the facts, none of the facts talk about the other movie set? What is happening? Am I hallucinating? Maybe I'm hungry. What in, what, what is this breach of contract count? What is this? An oral contract. Come on. 
plaintiff and defendants had an oral contract to share proceeds for prop and armor work on the old way movie set filmed in Montana in 2021 before rust. Seth acknowledged in a text message, the validity of this agreement plaintiff also rented leathers and guns also rent the, I'm reading this verbatim plaintiff also rented leathers and guns to this set on production. Okay. Loaned them, rented them out to, I guess is what they mean. These were rented through defendants on an invoice to production. Payment has been made to defendants by the movie set for old, the old way and plaintiff is owed over $10,000 for her payment and rental of the leathers and guns. There were no facts in the facts section of this that had anything to do with this. Okay. Plaintiff has, payment has been made to defendants for the movie. Hannah Gutierrez Reed is saying she's owed $10,000 for payment and for renting was she renting leathers and guns to the set? I what? What is he Isn't he the prop house? This whole section is confusing AF. And if you're like Emily, I'm confused. Same, same boo, same. I I am confusion. Defendant has not paid plaintiff Hannah Gutierrez read her monies owed for the prior set. They're like, all right, we're throwing this into. Defendant is liable for payment of the money owed. Good luck enforcing an oral contract. I don't know what the laws around oral contract are in uh, New Mexico, but if it is backed up into text messages, in text, we've seen a lot of text screenshots, but not this one. Also, there are no affidavits attached and a lot, a lot, a lot of multiple layers of hearsay and speculation in this, but not a lot of dates and no um, receipts. There's a few receipts. That's not true. There's a few receipts. Uh, jury trial demanded. That was an adventure I didn't expect to take today. I, on that first look, I did not expect it to be all of that. That is a lot of new information. I will probably... Um, clip this part down and also put it on the podcast because this is this is a lot going on in this lawsuit. We're going to be following this um, and the litigation that ensues. But I think if anything, this lawsuit got Hannah Gutierrez Reed's side of the story out into the public. And while that is not the primary goal, I don't think that's not a secondary goal of this lawsuit. This lawsuit got a story told. It sure did. Um, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of allegations. There's a lot of speculation shade. There's a lot of hearsay. There's a, you need a chart. You need photos with string. Wow. That was a lot. I hope you enjoyed that first reaction and breakdown of the Hannah Gutierrez Reed lawsuit. It is it is. It just is so wild. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. And thank you again for being here for another episode of The Emily Show. So raise a glass, stay hydrated. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. And may you drink water and mind your business. I've been watching a lot of TikTok. Drink water and mind my business. It's on Instagram too. I can't stop. I love it so much. I love people saying that that's what they're taking into 2022. I, I, I love all of it. So I'm going to go drink water and mind my business. And I can't wait to hear what you think of this episode. Tell me. Tell me on social. Tell me on Patreon. Tell me, tell me, tell me. I need to talk about this with the law nerds. Let me know your thoughts. Bye, friend. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.